Hey everyone, so I was recently listening to the Waveform podcast by Marques Brownlee and Andrew Manganelli, and in it they asked the question, is a humanoid robot a good idea? Essentially the argument or question is, is it better to have a bunch of specialized robots rather than to build a human looking one? Uh, and is there any actual benefit to having a humanoid shape compared to any other physical design? Uh, so I'm an HCI engineer, uh, human computer interaction. You could think of that as UI UX. I've done work on augmented reality experiences, even some hand tracking and gestural controls, and I also really like robotics and autonomy. So I wanted to share some thoughts on why I think the humanoid robot is actually a good idea. I wrote a quick article and I'll link to it in the description down below, but I'll be reading off of it and let's just get into it. So in the product design space, we often have to view these sorts of projects with a desirability lens and then contrast that with a feasibility lens. I think in regards to Tesla's ability to actually produce a bipedal robot that can do all of the things they mentioned, I'm not as optimistic as their timelines in the short term, but to explore why humanoid makes sense, I think we'll just have to assume that they can pull it off. A humanoid robot that can see, navigate, and interact with the world in a very similar way to humans using AI. And then that just sort of lets us focus on just the humanoid form itself. And I know it's a lot to assume, but let's just roll with it. So there are three main reasons that I think it makes sense to explore a humanoid form. One, it's a generalized solution. Two, uh, you're increasing theoretical maximums and designing for edge cases inherently. And then three, uh, you're providing a user with consistent UX or interaction design. So one with a generalized solution. Funnily enough, uh, Elon actually noted that a specialized solution will always accomplish a task better than a generalized solution when he was talking about Dojo, the uh, AI training supercomputer. And this is true, but to the human experience, many tasks that we do have diminishing returns when it comes to precision. In a factory or neural network training, having a specialized solution makes sense because you assume that we're not quite at the point of diminishing returns when it comes to building like a car that's built within microns of spec, right? We need to keep pushing toward this. But when it comes to doing something like folding your laundry or opening your door and bringing a package into your house, the generalized solution will probably be fine. So if you take the view of having 100 specialized robots or tools uh, is better than investing energy into building the Tesla bot, I think a good product to see how a similar debate played out in the past was actually with smartphones. Before smartphones, we had specialized tools, or robots as you could call them, to listen to music, give us directions, take pictures, send messages, and the list goes on and on. And sure, a specialized music device, a playback device, could give us a better music experience, but people clearly cared more about having their music with them at all times, uh, so we lived with the trade-off. A traditional point-and-shoot camera uh, took much better photos and had zoom compared to the smartphone ones that replaced them, but the best camera is the one that you have on you. So generalized or all-in-one solutions require so much less thought and are also more convenient for the end user. And additionally, in terms of capital efficiency, iPhones were very expensive. And when they first launched, they were more expensive than the devices that they replaced. And they did their tasks less well in many cases. Uh, however, because Apple only had one form factor they had to worry about, they were able to design a process which allowed them to take advantage of the economics of scale. They sold so many iPhones that you can now buy an iPhone for much less than what it would have cost to buy a GPS, MP3 player, camera, web browser, and you know all that sort of stuff. Uh, with the Tesla bot, you could theoretically achieve this scale benefit much quicker than if you were to build hundreds of specialized robots. And as Apple did it, they took the cost savings and they were able to reinvest that into the product to make it better until there was essentially no gap between the quality of the specialized solution compared to the generalized solution. And honestly, in some cases, it even surpasses that. Up next we have two, which is increasing theoretical maximums and designing for edge cases. So when you design a product, you come up with a vision content around it. So the goal here is to think about what this thing could be in one year, three years, ten years down the line. And if you do this experiment with something like a robot vacuum, you might be able to come up with some novel ideas about how the vacuum will have higher suction power or eventually be able to go under stuff, you know, lift stuff up maybe a little and get underneath things or even climb up walls and clean the walls. But at the end of ten years, the vacuum will still be just that. So when you're thinking about building this vacuum robot product, your theoretical maximum is likely focused on how clean the house can be, right? That's the goal you're solving toward. And when you're doing this vision exercise with a humanoid robot, we can align the theoretical maximums of the Tesla bot 
with those of ourselves. So maybe right now the bot can get groceries and open the doors for us, but in three years, maybe it will be able to unpack those groceries and use them to cook meals for us. And maybe in 10 years, it'll be able to maintain a home garden and come up with new recipes based on food science and cook and serve and clean all the pots and pans when I'm done eating, right? Here, this was only one subset of Tesla bot's potential uses. And the theoretical maximum in this field, which was you know groceries and food, extends to agriculture, nutrition, and cleaning even. So this was just for one use case, and we don't really know the theoretical maximum of humans because when we face physical maximums like running speed or distance, we build cars or airplanes. And to align the Tesla bot to the general abilities of a human, this should help expand theoretical maximums of the product, which would increase its total addressable market, which then once again feeds into the economies of scale. Related to maximums are edge cases. So if you design a robot to have one task, like a robot vacuum, how many edge cases will it be able to solve? We know that they can detect stairs and even some types of floors, and yes, you can program them to not go into certain parts of the house, but what happens when there are foreign and new objects in the way? Or what happens when there is something delicate left on the floor by a guest that happened to drop it during a scheduled cleaning session? Will the robot that is designed with the goal of cleaning be able to understand that this object should be moved to a different location before continuing with the room? If it does know this, how does it move the delicate object safely? It was only designed to be a vacuum, so it likely doesn't have appendages that would make manipulating a small object possible. If you wanted to design a robot that could handle all of the edge cases in a human world, it needs to be able to visualize and manipulate the world like a human. And this means that the task-purposed robots would need to have hands and legs anyway, which begins to defeat the purpose of having specialized robots. And while yes, there will be edge cases that the Tesla bot is not up to the challenge for, but because it is built as a general purpose machine, it could be iterated upon through hardware or software in a way that better handles the edge cases like a human would without taking up additional space or adding further complexity to the spaces we occupy. If Tesla is able to solve real world AI, and I know it's a big if, but just for the sake of the humanoid angle, we have to run with it, building hardware, for it that is not constrained by preset maximums will be extremely important in the goal of scaling its adoption. If you're focused on solving all of the small problems, so cleaning, transport, cooking, packing, and more, you will always be constrained by the scope of the project. And we already have a design with an unknown theoretical maximum, and that's humanoid. Up next is three, consistent user experience and interaction design. Think of all the smart things you have in your home. More likely than not, they all require you to learn a new interface. And so they're often built by different companies. They might work with Amazon Echo, but not Apple's HomeKit. They might have a hardware remote or be controlled by an app or just voice. And they might connect to the internet and stream data, or they might just exist and do their job. Even something that should be simple, like a TV remote, has way too many inputs when the user really only has one main goal, uh, watch the thing that I wanna watch. And so now let's expand this to a future where we have robotic instances of all of the appliances that we have and for all of the chores we wanna do. Will people have to teach their grandmothers that they can speak to the washing machine, but then they have to use their phone to vacuum the floor? Will robots get in each other's way if they're trying to complete tasks in the same part of the house? I mean, how many people use an iPhone every day but get tripped up when they're given a task on an Android phone? So having a consistent interaction paradigm for our autonomous assistants will make the technology accessible to many more people. And additionally, we are already understand the human interaction paradigm. So we talk or use sign language, we point and gesture, and humanoid robots would be able to enable a human-machine interaction uh, similar to that just of talking to another human, right? Asking your Tesla bot to clean the house twice a week while you're at work is way easier than scheduling your dusting robot, your vacuuming robot, your window wiping robot, your toilet cleaning robot, and others using a combination of phone apps, web pages, and voice commands. So we already see that OpenAI is able to accomplish impressive natural language processing using GPT-3, and with a humanoid body and vision and audio sensors, we could also see something like maybe natural gestural processing in the future as well. These were the main three reasons that I've been thinking about when it comes to why, if Tesla is able to achieve it, <laughs> a humanoid robot is better than a single purpose robot for replacing specialized tasks and even general tasks. I also think there are other reasons, like uh, portability comes to mind. So if you wanna bring your cleaning robot and your chef with you when you go on a vacation and stay at a rental home, would you rather pack the three or more robots required or just tell your Tesla bot to get in the backseat? 
So I'm super interested in the topic of human-robot interaction. I think there's a lot of work to be done in the space, even with autonomous cars, right? Future cars will need to be able to communicate with the pedestrians on the crosswalk or the other drivers around them if we want them to be truly safe. I think the question of whether or not Tesla can achieve this is a tricky one, and only time will tell. But from my viewpoint, I think going humanoid is a better future than going smart house. So thank you very much for watching, and I'd love to know your thoughts in the comments below. I know this was a bit of a different video. It was essentially me just reading an article to you, but uh, I had a lot of thoughts on this and I uh, wanted to get them down. So if you have any additional thoughts, I'd love to hear them. And I'd be super happy to keep this conversation going because this is just stuff that I'm really excited about. So thanks for watching.